Welcome to the Thought Dakota's YouTube channel. My name is Sean Mixon. I'm the Reasonable Fate uh, Dallas Chapter Director. And today I have a very exciting and interesting guest on with me. We're going to talk about the evidence for the resurrection. Uh, Mr. Chris Gonzalez, I, I understand that you're, you've are you been a Reasonable Fate Chapter Director and uh, you have an interesting mm -hmm. background. Could you Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I, I can, but when you said there's an interesting guest, I was hoping somebody else might come on out. Now, <laughs> now the burden, the burden's on me. You know, I am a Reasonable Faith Chapter Director. I've been blessed to be part of this ministry with you all since about 2017. And in that time, I've got to meet folks who are like you who are at the top of their game, you know, um, people who are teaching this to others. And so I get to receive it from you all. And even Dr. Craig, I've gotten to meet him and Dr. Tim Stratton, Tyson James, uh, there's just, there's an endless list of people I could, I could mention, but we are here in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, God's country, and uh, we love it out here. So we've been out here since 2017, and that's where I got to start being part of Reasonable Faith officially. Right, and, and so I understand you, you have a, uh, an interesting uh, background, too, sure. that provided you with a uh, uh, sure, sure. skill set. Sure, sure, Yeah. Yeah, could you tell almost, us a little bit about that? Well, I wish I wish I could say, yeah, I think what's the line? I have some uh unique I have a unique set of skills. Um but I I got to spend the last 19 years uh, serving in law enforcement. And so in that realm, I've been part of the local police force uh there in Texas. That's where I really cut my teeth uh in Bryan, Texas, and those guys really taught me the streets. And so I was there for about four years and I was an agent with the Department of Defense. I was a special agent in the Department of Defense working um, white collar crime. And then I got on, which was a lifelong dream with the FBI. And so I was with the FBI since 2009 until just January of this year. And during that time, I got to work SWAT, which was the best part of my career, getting to be part of SWAT, uh, the camaraderie, the missions, the ops, the... Uh, work that we did was some a real highlight of my career, but I also had an opportunity to work counterterrorism. I was uh, in the Directorate of National Intelligence, and I worked white collar uh, towards the end of my career, which just kind of wrapped up this January before I got to step into a new phase where the Lord is calling me, unexpectedly, albeit. Wow, that I mean, it it sounds like in, in this CSI uh age that we live in now with so many television shows right. when you right. to, to hear you saying this stuff it's almost like <laughs> it's a blend it's of, almost of unreal reality. yeah it's it's something unreal about it. it's like really did you did you do this stuff uh well, I, I used to tell people that there are days when i was in the fbi and i would say i can't believe they're paying me to do this we were wow. helicoptering in somewhere or we're doing a uh you know some sort of uh, secret operation. And then there were days I thought, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this stuff. I'm digging through trash or staring <laughs> at a stairwell for eight hours, you know, to make sure somebody's safe. And, um, but as a cumulative whole, what a career. Uh, I really, I know that the FBI is ha having some problems right now and understandably so, but I do take pride in uh, the work that, that I did while I was there. And I know there's a lot of good people still back there working very hard. Wow. So t talk to me. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, what, what kind of headspace do you have to be in uh, to do that in terms of processing the very real threat, like on your life and, and the, the sure. amount of danger? You know, I think it's, it's interesting the wide variety of people that the Bureau takes in, uh, there are so many skill sets. When you're a police officer, often you work in the same city, you go through the same academy, and then you go out into the, the same department, and everybody kind of has this path that they follow along, and then they kind of split up. But you all have this very strong background. In the Bureau, though, um, once you go through Quantico, you're all hired for very different reasons accountants, teachers, people with uh, backgrounds in special operations. Um, and then you go into the bureau and you work very different. You have very different lives. There are people that work on Indian reservations. 
who have told me stories about riding horses out to go uh, recover dead bodies. There are people who work wow. uh, with NASA on uh, helping to secure top secret information. And they're in laboratories and they're um, working, you know, classified operations. There are people who work violent crime all the way to working dental fraud, which is really terrible. There's some actually really terrible dental fraud that occurs. They would uh, charge families money to remove kids' baby teeth and do root canals on kids that never needed it. So there uh, are just this wide swath of, of individuals there that specialize in those. And then you have your hostage rescue team guys, uh, the folks out there that are kind of the tip of the law enforcement sphere when you need them. And so I got to be part of a little bit of each of those. And I really enjoyed being part of SWAT where I got to be a breacher and smash doors and yell at folks and go get the bad guys and then sit at my desk uh, during my other work part, work part of my work day and work white collar crime. And I got to really sit there in a more cerebral space, uh, working uh, almost um, almost like a gentleman's crime. You know, I'm not saying that there weren't victims, but in the sense that I would go to these doctor's offices to interview them uh, in their very nice offices sometimes, people who made a lot more than I did uh, in their business. And so it was, a, it was very interesting, but uh, really enjoyable. And being able to go from one switch to the other uh, was something that I tried to pride myself in, uh, being able to go from yelling at somebody and kicking in the door, then to holding a child and walking that child away, then right back to turn it, you know, from one to 10 and, and anywhere in between that you needed to be. So it was a, a great career. Hmm. What, what kept you? So, so did you, when you're mm -hmm. on a mission for SWAT, mm -hmm. I mean, do you think this may be my last time? I mean, you, no, I, I may don't, die I don't today. Think you think like... that. No, you think, you know, you thank God for uh, keeping you safe and you go in, but you have to go in when you're on SWAT and you're going to win. Uh, you're going to do whatever it takes to win. Um, that is fair and right. And uh, you're going to come home victorious. And that's just, you're going to protect your buddies and win the day. And, uh, you know, I think that in the back of your head, you, you think, all right, let's I hope this doesn't praise doesn't go bad, but you want to make sure that uh, you go in with confidence because if you start tiptoeing around, mm. things are going to go wrong. You just got to mm. commit and take care of business and uh, hopefully go get some breakfast tacos afterward. That was always good. I always mm. called home, told mom I was all right, and uh, told my wife I was doing good. And, um, it was it was it was great, but yeah, there's some close calls. There were probably more there are probably close calls i don't even know about so i thank god mm. for getting me here because there's a lot you know a lot can go wrong a lot has gone wrong uh and some some folks have, have paid uh the ultimate you know price for for our freedom and protection here unfortunately so very real aspect to it but you just have to just have to go go take care of business okay and so what what are you doing now you know, it's an interesting place I'm in. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Kindergarten Cop, I feel a little bit like <laughs> I've, I've transitioned into that realm. About two years ago, my son, he's now nine. He was seven at the time. He got bit by YouTube. And by, by bit mm. by YouTube, I mean he, like so many kids, saw something on YouTube we wished he wouldn't have seen. Luckily, it wasn't that bad, but it really upset him. It was these he always described his parents uh, who hate their kids and the kids had blood on their faces. And so we think it was some sort of family made dark satirical clickbait, mm. but he wondered why would somebody make that? And he didn't really see what else is on YouTube. Uh, we, mm. we like to say that YouTube is like gold in a minefield. Um, it's, there's wow. a lot of good stuff out there, but one click from disaster all the time. So then I signed him up for YouTube Kids, and I signed him up for, and I thought my fault as a parent, I should have signed him up for something. And when I saw it was on YouTube Kids, it was disturbing to say the least. Uh, we haven't, we well, I'll explain a little bit. We ended up writing an ebook about it called Poisoned Candy, and it seems so good, uh, but it's so dangerous for our youth's minds. And by kids, I mean 
tweens and teens as well. Uh, they're the ones who are actually really in that battle space of, of the digital realm. And so then the Lord kept tugging at me and I said, why can't there just be something good? Why can't there be good too? And that was it. And so in January of this year, I resigned from the FBI um, a few years short of retirement and we launched a company called Good Tube Kids. And so it's like YouTube, but all good uh, without all the sin and, and uh, danger. And so we built a new platform from the ground up. Uh, starting this year, we built a whole new platform where each video is chosen by us. We work with content creators that are already out there, like many of them your audience will know, Frank Turek and Cross Examined, Mike Lacona with Risen Jesus, Reasonable Faith uh, with Dr. William Lane Craig, and a lot of others. We have a lot of other things where we teach life skills and trail life hacks, uh, trail life being a a group for boys to go out camping, American Heritage Girls, the sister organization. So how to cook a fish over an open fire. In fact, just before this interview, I was editing a duck hunt we went on. And we just also went on a deep, uh, we went out halibut fishing in Homer, Alaska. And so we're editing those videos, showing the youth how to go duck hunting, what the gear is like, firearm safety, how to prepare the duck, what it tastes like when you get done. So from the, the bush to the table, the ocean to the table, all of those things that are good that you want your youth to learn, that's what we're putting on there and none of the bad. And so parents never have to worry about what their kids, tweens or teens might see. And so we launched this company, Good Tube Kids, and I can share my screen a little bit. But if you don't mind, uh, I'll just share what what our site looks like uh, so that folks can see it. And, um, you know, when, when we launched Good Tube Kids, uh, if you go right there and you search... I think you can see there. If you go right here and search, you can find out a video about us. The parents can click here. We have a motto, a safe place for kids and a resource for parents. And the kids can click here and then parents can subscribe them. You know, one of the things that we really have on there a lot of is Christian apologetics. You'll see the Brave books on there and then you'll see some descriptions and we're on Android and Apple. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a place where youth could learn. Um, they could be entertained and educated uh, without all the idiocy and obscenity and all those risks on YouTube or the degeneracy of some of modern day children's media. We wrote a, that ebook I said, Poison Candy, about that. And I wanted my son to know about the word apologetics before he turned 30, right? Our kids mm -hmm. need to know about mm -hmm. the evidence for their Christian faith. And just like it says in the Bible, so they don't get tossed about by bad philosophy, by bad thinking. Uh, so they don't get attacked the first time they're in college by somebody who says, well, there's no evidence for your faith or for the Bible, for the resurrection. And they say, oh, there's plenty of evidence for those things. Let me tell you. And they can just rattle off what Christian apologetics is uh, and, and how, why they have good reasons to believe uh, that, that what we claim is true is true. Yeah, I, I think you said a lot there. Uh... I actually want to go back, uh, take a step back, because we are living in a time now in society where there are these battles between worldviews. Mm -hmm. And by mm -hmm. worldview, I mean uh, like value systems, uh, mm -hmm. traditional uh, theists, people who be believers in God and specifically Christian believers. We believe that uh, what the morality is based in the nature of God. It is expressed through his commands. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have those commands in scripture. Uh, but we also see the rise of uh, like, like president Obama said several years back, uh, this isn't a America isn't a Christian country. And so we do see that there are a lot of uh, groups who, who feel like, as if a lot of the Christian values and, and the practices mm -hmm. are not just, uh, they are immoral, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, teach some, some people think it's immoral for you to teach your kids about God. Some people think now they think, uh, it's pro, they're promoting, uh, sex education, and under the guise of sex education, they're, they're uh, mm -hmm. trying to, I don't know what the goal is, but I've seen a lot of these 
uh, shows where the trans men and trans women are dancing mm-hmm. in front of kids. And if, like you said, it's gold in the minefield. If you just let your kids watch anything, uh, mm-hmm. click and, and, and click on things, you don't know what your kids are going to see what people uh, are teaching your kids. I mean, my daughter has, you know, she's watched several videos on, on YouTube mm-hmm. and, and she, you know, she's told me dad, this girl was saying something, something. What do they believe? Like, do they believe, mm-hmm. do they believe that morality is based on feeling? And so we've been having these philosophical questions. And so like, you, your, like you're saying, your daughter. Oh, she's, she's daughter? 11. Yeah. She's 11. 11. Yeah. Well, she's a perfect age for good two kids, you know, right, uh, right. We, can, we can bring her over there. Right. You know, that's, that's a big thing that you said about worldview. And so that's the problem with good to, uh, with YouTube, with YouTube kids, Disney and Nickelodeon. Uh, if you see the book that we wrote poison candy and you see what they're showing your children, you'll realize that the problem isn't that it slipped in. The problem isn't that it slipped by their filters. It mm. is what they think is good. And so therefore they are pushing it onto your children. And so as Christians, we have to realize there's two vastly different worldviews here. And we're going to have to admit that that and ours do not comport. They they cannot coexist um, and they cannot be the same. And so in, in doing so, then we're going to have to make choices. We're going to have to uh, remove ourselves from those those areas because we say at good tube kids somebody is always preaching to your child what is the mm. message and oh. generation z <laughs> yeah oh chris you you're just full of zingers <laughs> Z- that, we, you I've are a zinger machine a <laughs> but you say generation z has been uh, online or are they they spend an average of seven to nine hours and some some portions of generation generation alpha um, are estimated to spend up to 14 hours a day on a screen or t- of some device, some sort mm-hmm. of device, whether it's school, maybe for work um, and then personal. And so who is if the children are in church one to two hours a week, who's winning the war? Who's oh. winning that messaging battle? Uh, sheer volume. So then we we have to conquer the digital realm. And one of the things that we want to do and I want to do is mm. be a, a warrior in that space, right? Uh, for too long as Christians, we've gotten into the harbor and just protected ourselves. But there's no more time for that. Now we need to go back out and take the space back. Um, like you said, Absolutely. that President Obama had mentioned, we're no longer a Christian nation. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, it doesn't have to be that we've abandoned those those feel those values um, and underpinnings because once those go, once the Moors go, you've seen what's happened to the culture. Um, there's no no sense of truth. Uh, and I want to mention something you said earlier. If we do then believe uh, as Christians that there is a truth, one objective truth. If we do then believe that, then everything else would then be false. That that goes against that. But if somebody wants to spread a false message or just distract you from the truth, that doesn't have to be coherent. Hmm. And so we were playing a game one time. I think it was like a Pictionary. And the teams have to guess, you're drawing a bicycle or whatever. The other team just started to be rabble rousers. And they just started to yell various answers. Now, they don't have to be yelling the wrong answer in unison. They don't have to all be on the same page. It's just noise that blocks out the truth for you. Mm. And so that's what you'll see um, when people start, when you, the, as, a, as you start to focus on your Christian faith and the evidence, and we, we were talking a little bit about the resurrection before we started filming here, people start to throw out all sorts of crazy theories, right? They start to throw out the swoon theory, the, hallucin- the group hallucination theories. Theories that have no grounding uh, evidentially, uh, that have no um, other underpinnings when you look at them independent of, I just want to negate the most likely truth, which is there was uh, the life, death, and resurrection of a man named Jesus, who, whom they considered to be the Christ. And so it just has to be noise uh, that, that can block you from the truth. Uh, we always say that the devil... 
The devil doesn't care what you're doing as long as it's not focusing on God. That that's uh powerful. Uh this idea of noise. Mm-hmm. Uh wow. Like you you don't you don't really have to hear the message. Mm-hmm. You just mm-hmm. have to be distracted by so so the the quantity uh, uh of messaging that you're receiving mm-hmm. and uh since and, and and consequently you'll have sensory overload. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're overloaded with with uh with your senses with different messages. This group they're they're arguing for 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 this position and this other group is uh, arguing for this position and and now mm-hmm. I I'm I'm a Christian but I don't know I mean are is everyone wrong but me you know the the, the question mm-hmm. of the the truth of the exclusivity uh of mm-hmm. Christianity and the, and its claim of objective truth becomes uh young people begin to to question it. why do why do you know why do uh, why are we uh, the ones uh, who who argue for the truth when those other people they 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 seem to care about what they're saying just as much they're passionate just like we are and you know it, it's it's interesting you talked about the exclusivity I was just thinking while you were saying that we never are concerned about exclusivity when it comes to mathematics right two plus two mm. equals four it doesn't equal a nearly infinite number of other options. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't. It's not rude to those other options to say that that's not true. It just simply is the fact that it's not true. Um, right. Uh, right. And whatever else you write down also isn't correct, no matter how much you feel it is. And so um, that's that is part of what we need to teach our youth. We need to help them associate objectivity with their faith rather than mm-hmm. so solely subjectivity. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's exactly what you're doing uh, when you're when you're doing podcasts like this. You're helping people work through thinking uh, because mm-hmm. this podcast won't answer every every question. But if it helps them think to think, then we've helped set them uh, forward, whether they're 80 or eight. Uh, we've helped in- increase their ability or, or desire to think better. Absolutely. And. So I, I, I want to throw out two things I, I would love to get your feedback on. The mm-hmm. first one, and it's still relating before we move into some of the content, I think, uh, but it's the first one has to do with the, the type of uh, revenue, uh, the type mm-hmm. of uh, technical technological power you need to compete with a lot of these giants who are yes. able to I mean, ha- they have a million servers with a hundred Google mm-hmm. plexus of, of memory, you, you know, and, and mm-hmm. they can, they have 30 yes. years worth of video storage and, and, and spaces. How yes. do you compete with such a giant like that? What is your, your plan and what, what has been the challenge as far as like with your website to, to, yeah, to build a great, great question. Yeah, you're 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 expressing the thoughts I have uh, usually every morning before I read scripture and have coffee. <laughs> what have I done, right? <laughs> you know the the thing I think most often are two phrases when it comes to this. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And the other one, if you have to eat a frog, do it first thing in the morning, right? <laughs> and so. I, I used to get up, and when we first decided to do this, because we are taking on a, a, a huge, and huge is an understatement, right? Like you said, Goliath. 30 years and a Goliath. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not what's, to, you know, the fact that it's a huge challenge uh, when you're protecting your youth isn't what makes you decide are you going to or not going to do it right mm-hmm. when the uh, when the mother steps out between her child and and the bear or the car or the semi she never thinks you know is am i going to overcome this i simply have to we have to stand in front of our children they 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 are being there we give a talk called how to protect your children physically spiritually and emotionally in the digital age because there are real casualties in this digital age. If the sound of freedom isn't opening people's eyes 
to the fact that it's not all happy TikTok videos out there. If uh, working cases where you see real casualties, you know, telling stories about teens who have taken their life because of their exposure to social media and uh, what, you know, the messages YouTube was putting down into their eyes and ears, there's real danger here. And so uh, we need to offer both, um, we need to alert people, we need to illuminate their minds to the danger, and then we need to give them solutions. And that's what we're here to do, a safe place for kids and a resource for parents. That's our, that's our motto. But what we are asking is people just to join along. If you're hearing this and you have a youth that's a, a kid, a tween, a teen, and you want them to be in a safe place, subscribe to GoodTube Kids for $10 a month. You don't have to worry about what they're going to see or hear. And I think that's a, that's a reasonable price to pay for protecting their eyes and their innocence because, golly, once they're exposed, that uh, toothpaste is out of the tube. And um, it's hard to go backwards. And two, most commonly, youth the average age now for youth being exposed to pornography is eight years old. Oh and it often God. happens at school and it happens through servers. And if, if your youth has access, and we could talk about all this at a different podcast, but if your youth has access to the internet, it can and always will be a possibility that they're just one click from disaster, whatever that is. Pornography, mm -hmm. addiction, uh, danger, ide dangerous ideologies, dangerous ideas. It's all right there for them. Uh, and it's being pushed as an algorithm. So if you're hearing this and you don't have the young ones at home anymore, um, if you go to GoodTube Kids and you want to support our mission, we have a place there where you can click to give to us monthly. We have a big, big task ahead of us. But, you know, I tell people, I went into this. I have no background in videography. I have no background in app development. I have no background in any of that, but I know two things. I know how to fight and I know what's right and God will take care of the rest. And so now we just march forward, right? Uh, we just march forward and do the good work, pray to the Lord, trust he'll provide. Uh, all those scriptures that we read, they are for such a time as this, right? Uh, that he'll provide for you and we don't do it. Um, for the worldly good, right? We do it for uh, what we can do for the kingdom. So, so here we go. We're off. Yeah. So, so how many videos would you say you had on your on good to good to kids now? Uh, we right have now? A, we have eleven thousand two hundred eighty two minutes. So we probably have one hundred and sixty hours of videos right now. What? Yeah. And how yeah, was that process up uploading though? <laughs> it's it's it has videos. been yeah. It's a lot of it's a lot of elephant, right? Every day you 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 you're working on a really um, you, when you get to sit back at launching this company and the legal the apps that we just came out, you know, having the apps now on Apple and Android was a huge uh, step, and then um, getting the videos uploaded and providing a system for that, providing um, getting the word out, filming. Um, so it's, a, it's an all day, every day kind of thing with as, as many on other entrepreneurs and many other people who are on mission and, and working for the Lord as they do the, just the same. And so this is, this is the realm that I'm in. Um, uh, but to get, we have a lot of great content there. You know, we have outdoor content and we have, uh, children can learn about their Christian faith. A lot of that content, uh, puppetry for the younger kids, uh, we're getting, but we'll also be doing, uh, I'll be teaching kids uh, firearm safety. Uh, we're trying to be do some interviews of some great careers, uh, you know, an NFL lineman, a Navy SEAL. Um, what's it like to be a, a welder or work on a fishing boat so that kids can see that you can be in the world, but not of the world. You can mm -hmm. go out there and you don't have to hide your faith. You, you don't have to, to put your faith over here and then your sports and your academics and everything is over here. We teach youth that your faith is at the foundation and we build upon that and um, that you have to learn your priorities. So there's so much work to do. Uh, digital media, Mr. Rogers, I have a puzzle back there. I don't think you can see it on the bookshelf, but back in the 80s, he used to think that youth were overstimulated. And he mm. would roll in his grave if he only oh. knew where they are now. And so, you know, even though we're a, we're a media company, uh, we provide content. I don't want your kids on uh, the tablet all day long or the phone. You know, 
I know that one day I'll have to answer to God for everything I said and didn't say, I did or didn't do. And I'm telling you that those other media companies don't think the same way. Uh, and so that's at the very foundation of what we're doing. I, I wouldn't want it to do to your, to you know, provide or offer your family or ch children anything. I wouldn't want my own son to see. And I'm trying to raise him to be, you know, a young Christian man of tomorrow. And so the same for your family. And so, so how many more, how many more videos can you add? Like, how does that work? Do you need to, do you have a certain amount of space? Do you have to keep purchasing we, we servers? Pay, when... Yeah, we pay, pay for, pay for servers. And so we pay for space. And so we, we went through our first round of 10,000 minutes pretty quick. Um, and so we were able to put those videos on there and now, uh, we're just adding more content, add more content, add more content. We really want to have something there for everyone and then continue to evaluate what they're seeing. But we like to say that good tube kids is like steak and mashed potatoes in, uh, YouTube kids and Disney Nickelodeon. That's like Mountain Dew and cotton candy. It's going to be hard to pull them off of all that mm. stuff, but it's going to give them cavities. If you, if, mm. you, if we don't get in the game there, it's going to give them cavities. Uh, right. and mental, mental cavities are the worst. So Will you, let's, um, go ahead. Oh, I, I was thinking, would you, are you, are you thinking about competing with YouTube as far as giving, uh, users the ability to upload videos at some point? Potentially. I, I think that YouTube, you know, what's the first word in YouTube? You. And that has right. created a, a very narcissistic culture and unfortunately has told youth that they need to focus on influencing thousands of people they've never met and will never meet rather than their own communities. And so we have our eyes and ears in this intentionally, um, it's, a, it's, an, a drug, it's a drug, right? That, that YouTube, those clicks, those Facebook likes. I, I'm telling parents to tell their kids, influence your friends. Influence your church, influence at your school where you can make a real difference. If though you have something that you want to teach that is good, good is the standard for what we put on good tube kids, uh, not just you. And so if you have something, which I think it's important for youth to be able to learn, we do want to make a system where they can submit a video, but we want to slow down some of that feedback and some of that desire to keep posting, keep everything I eat, every my shoes. What do I look like? This new dance. We need to push that away. That's that's a bad habit for kids and adults, but a bad habit for youth. And so if you want to teach us about your horse or your hobby or do something, we do want to make a system where you can send us that video and we can upload it. Uh, but we really need to rethink what have we done. Uh, we can't just say that this is, well, it's just the way it is. It's always going to be that way. It's harming our youth. Okay. So... We, we've we talked about, uh, you said you wanted your son to know the definition of of apologetics. And that mm -hmm. it's interesting to me that you said that because that's exactly what I wanted to talk about uh, today. Uh, so could you start with what the definition of apologetics is and how that is relevant to our faith as Christians? Mm -hmm. Well, you can kind of see over the back of my shoulder here, that's the end of the word apologia. And as you know, mm -hmm. uh, in in the Greek, the word apologia is most well no notoriously used in 1 Peter 3.15, uh, where it says, We often forget as apologists, regard your Lord as holy, and always be prepared to give a defense, a reason for the mm. hope that's within you. Yet do so with gentleness and respect. So I, sometimes we forget those bookends. Uh, regard your Lord as holy, yet do so with gentleness and respect, which are really important. But what they're asking there, as, as you well know, is to give a legal defense. Tell me um, why evidentially I should believe or uh, what you are claiming or what has been done or, or what we're doing here. And so... The the evidence, uh, which was something that was um, part of my life for a long time, uh, builds up. Uh, I've I've always really enjoyed the philosophical evidence, the ability to sit and kind of think through the evidence for. Let's start with God and well, that we exist and that God exists. Then and then we just move on down the line. And the beauty of Christian apologetics for those who are listening and, and haven't got into it. Um, is that you can study every realm in the world and you'll never run out of 
great evidence for the Christian faith, and you'll never run out of uh, new things to learn. And so from cosmology, um, cosmogony, to uh, the historicity of um, the Bible, the accuracy of the translation of the text, uh, to the life and times of Jesus and who he was, every one of those has a, has a, a, a beautiful set of endless evidence that you can go through um, to, to learn more about your faith so that then you can share it. Like Dr. Craig says, there's a difference between knowing your faith is true and uh, showing your faith is true. Yeah, I I think it's interesting what you just said, because it's it's absolutely fascinating that a lot of the evidences for the Christian faith, the Christian evidences, uh, as, as Dr. Craig puts it, <laughs> uh, the arguments and the evidence. But a lot of those evidences, w- once you begin to study them historically, uh, arose from from a context of some expert in some obscure field mm-hmm. who's like, Hey, mm-hmm. who's like, Hey, uh, I do this stuff. This is, you know, and, and now mm-hmm. they, and they bring to light things that we often don't. I mean, we, we, we're just reading the scripture. We would never, we would never have known. And it's mm-hmm. like, once you, you, you study the evidence, what you find out is that the scripture is even more valid than we can, Mm-hmm. We, we we ever thought you know once i began to study like the scripture historically and look at archaeology i was like really <laughs> mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. there was a place called Je- like it, it's there are so many different confirmations uh yep. of the scripture does does what does apologetics relate to those confirmations in in some sense well you know i think really apologetics is the practice of knowing, studying, and finding those confirmations uh, within what we would call general revelation, right? Those things that are are around the world that we see that are uh, open to all of us, um, seeing how those correlate and and correspond and buttress uh, the special revelation, which would be scripture and I think you could also put in there any time that you have an inner a personal interaction with with God. Uh, but God has given us this this bounty of you, like you said, Scripture, that then we just continue to see. Oh, this! Wow, I didn't real I didn't realize that that word meant so much. You know, one thing we're looking at we we're talking about the resurrection, and uh, since we're talking evidence and we're talking criminal cases, you remember uh, in the um, many people remember the Passion of the Christ, or they at least remember when C- Christ was crucified and the story of him being pierced with a spear in the side and and the blood and the water coming out from his side for so long. So many scriptural, those who studied scripture, uh, practice hermeneutics, they would say, well, that's an actual water. We don't actually have water in our bodies in that area. And they said, you know, it must be, um, some sort of metaphor for a a new Mm -hmm. birth or, or baptism or something like that. And then we flat fast forward and like you said, somebody in their field who has studied bodies said, no, when a when a body is suspended like that uh, and fluid begins to fill the lungs, if it's pierced at the correct angle, that water, that, that buildup of fluid in the lungs will flow out and you will get that same effect. And so here this whole time, evidence has been staring us in the faith, in the face and in the faith, and we weren't... Um, able to recognize just how evidential it is. And so for those who are reading scripture, uh, we need to take hold of scripture for all that it's worth. Uh, We really need to to learn it, um, not because it changes your salvation, of course, right? It doesn't change your relationship with God, but it sure can strengthen your faith during times of doubt and when your son or daughter comes to you and says, well, why is this true? Or how do we know that? Uh, you have an apologia. You can do Christian apologetics. You can say, well, let me explain to you why, why this is this way. And so that, that's it. Your, your, your child has just asked you, why do you believe? Why do you have that hope inside of you? And you're ready. And so what a better witness we can be for Christ if we practice apologetics. 
So I, I think one question that, that kids have generally, and especially Christian kids, about uh, Christianity is this problem of history, this separation mm-hmm. of, of time between us today and those people in the, in the Bible 2,000 years ago. Were they, were they real people? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. how, how do we know that Jesus wasn't uh, like Santa Claus? Uh, uh, I guess that's a bad example because Santa was kind of based on the real person. <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> you know, yeah, how, but but how, how do we know that this, you know, my son has asked me, and I'm sure your daughter has the, kind of these same questions. And so oftentimes I've heard uh, the use of, well, do you believe that George Washington was real? Now, George Washington seems very real to kids, especially those uh, often in a public school system where they've had mm-hmm. plays about George Washington, mm-hmm. like we used to do when we were younger. And they've, they've seen George Washington, goodness gracious, every year. And he's on the dollar bill. And we say, and they say, well, of course, George Washington's real. Well, why? Well, look how much evidence we have. Well, let's look at how much evidence do we have for Jesus. And we have all of this as a evidence. Now, uh, for older older youth, uh, that are asking the same questions, you can really go into textual evidence examination and talk about uh, Caesar. And we can talk about um, some of the really well-known, and I put air quotes, well-known figures of history and see how little and how late we really have evidentially of their existence, yet we doubt it nonetheless. Um, and so it just depends. I think that's one of the good things well about good tube kids is kids can search those questions on there and you know they're going to great they're going to get good resources um on on that site we have one minute apologist uh, bobby conway worked with us and he has these little snippets that are so digestible on so many topics right and then uh frank turek and dr craig have given us some extra uh, some other videos that we put on there and so your youth can go through these topics and imagine feeling rest assured that when your youth has a question or the next video up uh, just buttresses and strengthens their Christian faith rather than uh, breaks it apart and seeks to attack it uh, so that we're all on the same field, right? We're all parents, the church, and the very screens in their hands we're giving them are seeking to do uh, what's best for that child and to build the kingdom. Let me ask you this, so, because, so this goes into a little bit about your background in, in, uh, in law enforcement and as an, as an investigator, I would just tip my hat, tip where I'm coming from and say this, because I think it was brilliant what uh, Dr. Craig said about, uh, about Adam being a real person. So Mm -hmm. he, 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 in, in his study of Romans, uh, in his study of the historical Adam, he said, well, Mm -hmm. uh, was Adam a real person? And And Dr. Craig says, well, Adam has to be a real person. And based off of scripture, because Adam is thought to have effects and no Mm -hmm. fictional characters have real world effects. World effects. Yeah. Right. You know, and I said, I said, oh, my God, that's 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 it's genius. Well, so Mm -hmm. and it just makes me wonder as a as a former investigator and law enforcement officer, how did you all know when someone was was fraudulent? Oh, that's a good question. It's like it comes at it from the opposite yeah. end, right? Because <clears throat> right, I'm pretty right. sure you guys had to say, "Hey, this something is odd. You're not representing Something's yourself, fishy. yeah, right?" As yeah, no, that's a we... great question. We well, you start to get a good sense of when things don't add up. Uh, now, I I do like to tell my son when we're looking at something, and I, and I, when you're looking for something, put your hands behind your back. And look, just take a second and look, because I think we get frenzied. And if you could see my desk here, it's not the tidiest thing right now. <laughs> uh, fortunately, you can't see it in camera. But if I was looking for that <clears throat> receipt or my wallet or something like that, and I just start digging in and looking in this fren- frenetic, frenetic way, um, I'm not really looking. I'm doing more than I'm looking. And so mm. when we start to examine a case, I think there is a need to sit back and think. Let's think about this. Why would they say they were there? Why would they do that? Right? And we think about the disciples, in fact, we talk about the resurrection. Why would they lie? What did they gain? 
Um, and so if we want to say, if somebody wants to say, well, the disciples were a fraud, okay, that, that's, an, that's an accusation that we can examine. Now, why do people commit frauds? To save face, um, often, uh, to either save face or to gain. So you're really neutral or above, but rarely do people lie in order to gain negativity. Um, right. it, it would even have to be, maybe somebody gets, right, it's lost, right? Now, maybe somebody gets thrown in jail because they're, the, they're not the real bomber, but they say they're the bomber, but they perceived that they got reward. Do you know what I mean? They thought, oh, this notoriety, I never mm. would have had this before. Mm -hmm. I'm able to go down as some sort of criminal mastermind that I really mm -hmm. wasn't. Um, but the disciples, if you're, if you're reading the gospels, you read Acts, uh, if you read Paul's letters, this was hard. This was a hard life, uh, that took them from, from all that they would have wanted to have, you know, right. Jay Warner Wallace talks about sex, power, and money. And I don't see how they gained anything. Um, so for those who are looking at the Christian faith and they're saying, well, here's a reason think about that is, is is there is that a really good reason um who, right who had who had a desire and who had uh ability to gain and so i think that's you're asking about frauds uh also too good to be true like does that really make sense was something i ask people a lot of times like hey i won the um I won the Irish lottery. Well, did you put in for the Irish lottery? No. Hmm. Or, um, you know, uh, they said they'll give me a million dollars if I give them another hundred. Why don't you just tell them to take it out of the million dollars that you're going, they're going to send you? Uh, well, mm -hmm. they can't do that. Well, these things sound too good to be true. And so they're just too far-fetched. And so when we hear about the um, swoon theory of the resurrection, we were mm -hmm. talking about that earlier. You know, in the swoon theory, uh, some people purport that, well, Jesus actually, he looked like he died on the cross, and then they buried him, and then he was able to, with no, no miraculous effects, crawl out of a tomb where, after having been hung, flogged, poked in the side by a spear, his, you know, wrists <laughs> and heels pierced, overcame the guards, crawled into town, and said, I'm the risen Jesus. I need help. This is the, the this does not comport. It, it's not it's not reasonable to think that that's mm -hmm. true. That seems like a like a fraud. It, that 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 theory seems Absolutely. fraudulent because it's it's too far fetched. There must be some other reason. And then the you know, the disciples said, Well, no, we believe you're the Christ. Uh let us bandage you and, and pray you survive. Um, CPR. Does, none of this makes sense. <laughs> Do you know what that that makes that makes a, a ton of sense? And as you were speaking, I actually thought that on that view, Jesus Jesus was actually a fraud. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, in, in, in almost in almost every view that isn't what he says he is. You know, the old liar, lunatic Lord. Uh, not mm -hmm. as not as often now, but. Otherwise, he's a fraud. He's a, or 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 a lunatic. When lunatics are still frauds, they they just are also having uh, trouble recognizing that themselves. Um, right. So yeah, on on all of those theories, he he's not. And even uh, Islam would say that he wasn't hung. It was a it was an effigy, or it was something else mm -hmm. that appeared to be him. Some say Judas, and so uh, yeah, some uh, say Judas. Judas, and so there's these other Judas ideas. Was hung. But then all of Scripture, everything that points to him, and then everything afterwards, he he would have been fraudulent to them. Mm -hmm. uh, he would have, would have been a con man. I I think just to take a couple of steps back, I think the way you began uh, your advice on how to begin this this uh, inquiry was was spot on, because you said when you look for something and you're frantic you're in an emotional state. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times, a lot of these questions, uh, especially for kids, they are, they become emotional. Right. And so, so this, this, this advice to 
relax, calm down, and let's mm-hmm. think. It's a it's a it's a headspace you need to be in to begin to answer these questions, uh, because and for parents, when you, right? And for parents who don't who feel like they don't know, that can be difficult. Uh, when when the parent feels intellectually threatened, um, not I'm not saying this in a negative way. I'm just saying when you're like, Ugh, I don't remember when your kid <laughs> at, like when your kid asks you. Where do babies come from? Like the first time you kind of feel like, uh, and, and it's not that you don't know where they come from. Yeah. <laughs> it's just how, how, how do I phrase this? Right. There's a bit of a uh, bit of panic there. Well, yeah. I think how do I explain this is the, is mm-hmm. the root of that. How do I explain this properly uh, right now? And so when you when, when your son says, yeah, sometimes I pray, but I, I really don't know if there's anybody out there. I don't hear anything. Mm-hmm. Well, so what do I do? It's a big question, you know? Um, and so we have to be willing to say, okay, well, let's think about this. Let's think. And, and if you start there, at least you can show them that you're thinking together. Mm-hmm. Let's, let, because I don't want to just be uh, Alexa, right? Show me the evidence of the resurrection. The evidence of the resurrection is Jesus, you know, the evidence, I want them to yeah. learn to think because what about when I'm not there? Absolutely. Abso- absolutely. And and then you actually, then you moved into saying, okay, let's think, what are the reasons? We, mm-hmm. we pause, we breathe, then we begin to think, okay, well, what are the reasons? And what I like to think is, all right, someone says Jesus didn't exist, but why do they think that? Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, don't just go with the the objection. You know, I tell my kids, I mean, you can say anything. Mm-hmm. A person can make any claim, but mm-hmm. I mean, just because I can say the sky is pink. Okay. The, the more important question right. is, why do you think that? And once you begin to, because... It's kind of like Dr. Craig said, uh, says, and I forgot where he said this actually, but he said, Christians are so eager to respond that sometimes we don't, we take the, uh, the burden mm-hmm. of proof when it's, when it's not our burden. It's never ours. Yeah. You know, and, and you get, I mean, we, we makes, it makes us have to feel like as, as though we need to respond and come up with a defense. I mean, but the person who is making the crazy claim, mm-hmm. you know, is the one I mean, Jesus never existed. What? Yeah, I mean, I've heard, we have two thousand years say, of know, history. Exactly. We have gr- we have great evidence, and so if if they're going to say that they're either, and I, I say this as nice as possible, ignorant to the information available, or unwilling emotionally to accept that information. You know, when I was a cop, I used to go and have to do death notifications. And when I would do a death notification, you'd knock on the door and uh, Mrs. Smith, um, my name's Officer Gonzalez with the police department. And uh, is your husband, John? Yes, he is. And was he driving a, a red pickup truck? Yes, he was. Uh, I'm sorry to inform you that he, he's dead. He passed away in an accident. And so there I have his driver's license and wallet, you know, maybe blood stained. And the woman says, no, 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 it can't, no, I, it can't, no, it can't be true. It can't be, it can't be. Now, are they unwilling to believe because of the lack of evidence or because emotionally they don't want it to be true? Oh, that's great. And I, and I don't blame them for where they are. Mm-hmm. But I'm just saying it's not because of the lack of evidence. Mm-hmm. Why are they saying no? And so we have to understand what the impact is on somebody's world when they realize that there is a God and there is a Jesus and there is a objective right and wrong. Those are, those are big changes uh, for somebody. Mm -hmm. And so they, they may be you wondering why aren't my arguments working? I've thought that why, why isn't the presentation of the evidence sufficient enough to convince you? There's a lot of going on in that side of that mind. Um, and so we need to be aware of that as apologists. 
absolutely absolutely i mean you have a way with words uh <laughs> uh hit the net head on the uh the nail on the head <laughs> hit the head on the nail Thank you. yeah that's hit right the head on the nail but <laughs> but uh yeah i think that's i think that's right because i heard peter peter williams peter j williams uh say that christianity makes a claim on our freedom and it makes claims mm-hmm. about all of us and we don't like it when 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 someone uh makes a stake on our own lives and uh and it makes mm-hmm. it i mean it, it becomes personal if mm-hmm. if all have sinned and come short of god's glory and if we if we are not declared righteous then we are condemned uh mm-hmm. then there's a problem when you mm-hmm. when you mm-hmm. share the gospel with me because that means if I don't accept it I'm I'm condemned. Mm-hmm. I can't believe that. <laughs> right, Especially right, if I right. don't want I don't want to bend the knee to Jesus. I don't want to bend the knee to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so it's like, well, Jesus never exists. I, I need I need some way to right. rationalize the claim in the uh stake that the gospel makes on on my life. Uh, and, and who do men say that I am? Well, you know, I can't say you're the son of God in the Christ. You have to be, you know, just some prophet. Otherwise, you know, uh, uh, uh what you're Otherwise, saying, too much comes with it. it. It's a lot. It's a lot that comes with it. And it's a, it's a response. I, I have a decision to make who, <laughs> who, who are you? Right. And so, uh, I think that's absolutely right. And, uh, I think that's a perfect uh, place to wrap up this this interview today because I we didn't get I think I think we went very deep but what I love about this conversation mm-hmm. what I love about your ability to communicate is that it is clear enough you speak with clarity enough so that children adults uh, uh and, and and just all people those in general, who have ears to hear right they can understand and I think we've we've answered some questions, and you've given some 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 great advice on a step that you can take in any situation where your faith is being uh, challenged for both children mm-hmm. and adults. Let's, what let's let's settle ourselves. Uh, let's let's, let's calm down. Ourselves. Let's not right. be too emotional. Uh, then let's let's examine the reasons. And and mm-hmm. once we begin to examine the reasons, it's something you said. You said if it's improbable, if the scenario doesn't seem to uh, fit with what generally occurs, uh, the 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 facts and the explanation of the facts, if those things don't fit with what generally occurs, then there's a problem. And when mm-hmm. we look at the resurrection. The facts and the swoon theory, the right. <laughs> generally, if you don't fit together, you, right? If you don't fit, if you don't, uh, if you're crucified and you're stabbed and you're beat yes. forty times and hung on a cross, you're not gonna just get up and and, and <clears throat> live a life and, hey, I'm Jesus, and and they're not, and yes. most people wouldn't think you were yeah. resurrected. They certainly, the resurrected king, certainly not. Now, some listeners may think, well, but that's not fair because resurrections don't normally happen. That's fair. But when we look at cumulative case apologetics, which we didn't get in tonight, uh, you can start to say, yes, but in the situation with these other facts, you have to look at the whole case. Mm-hmm. So you can't mm-hmm. just look at that one situation. Uh, you have to look at, a, especially in the, we say in the government, don't make a federal case out of it. There's a reason. Because it's a huge case, and we take all mm. of the evidence, which could be years of evidence in a case, mm. and then we bring all of that to bear to say that this is the situation. Mm. And so uh, when we look at the breadth of evidence for the Christian faith, uh, it all works together systematically. So we, um, when people say, well, but what about this? There are more answers to be given, and they're not ad hoc. They're not uh, something we're just trying to throw in to make the first one thing work out. If you, you'd say, okay, well, if we if we really want to 
start at the very beginning, let's start here and work our way to this point. And it won't sound like we're making up answers to make this work. The foundation's mm-hmm. already been laid. Mm-hmm. So uh, don't worry. There are answers. I, there are, that's why I tell people, you don't have to know them all. Just don't worry. There are answers. Mm-hmm. Calm yourself. Settle, settle yourself. It goes back, back to that. Mm-hmm. And search patiently for those answers. And you can follow the evidence where it leads. And that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of what I thought when I was 18 years old. I said, well, what if God didn't exist? And I was just sitting on my couch. I said, would I want to know that? Mm-hmm. And I said, I said, fair well, question. I said, well, I guess, I guess I would. And mm-hmm. I decided at that point, I said, I'm going to pursue truth. And mm-hmm. I, I'm just so grateful and, and happy that the more I pursued truth, you know, even objections, the more I studied them, the more I felt, oh, this is, that's not, that doesn't make sense. That's not a good objection. Mm-hmm. But before I look mm-hmm. into it, I was, as a fear, uh oh, what if, what if they're right? Right, right, right. You know, but once you look into it, it's like well, that's not really that. That's not true. <laughs> that's not a valid argument. And right. uh, so I'm grateful. I'm grateful to God that that he he is a God that reveals Himself mm-hmm. in human history uh, in a, in a in a way that is perceivable. Uh, by the census and some of the gospel, uh, one of the writers, uh, I think it was John. He said those things that our hands have, have felt, you know, our eyes mm-hmm. have seen, this is what we're sharing with you. We're not sharing with you some spiritual, spiritual uh, 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 experience that no one <laughs> that didn't happen in history. Right. They're right here did, for you to learn too. Right. We're, we're telling you some things that really happened and mm-hmm. the resurrection is a historical religion. Uh, so mm-hmm. this this mm-hmm. moralism where it's like I'm spiritual, but I'm not, you know, I'm not religious. Right, and, right, and right. It doesn't work with the resurrection because Christ made real claims. Uh, he was a real person. We have historical records. And the best explanation for the fact that he was crucified and, and uh, the disciples saw him and that mm-hmm. uh, the tomb was empty uh, and the, the, his first discoveries were women is that right. God resurrected him for, from the dead. That is the simplest explanation. And it explains all the facts and you don't need to mm-hmm. create another explanation to, uh, go with it. So it's not That's ad hoc, right. you know, so, uh, uh, yeah, all the good terms ad hoc Occam's razor, they all apply. But like you said, I think that there's room for another, another interview, uh, another discussion, Mm-hmm. Really, because uh, people need to hear it. And even though it exists on paper somewhere, somewhere on the web, uh, as Christians, we need to go out, seek it, read it, uh, have it in our minds and on our hearts. Because uh, if we don't, then what what good is it to us? So uh, for those who are out listening, there are great resources. I'm sure you can find them uh, at Thought Decoder and Sean Mixon. And uh, we look forward to offering them uh, for your youth. At Good Tube Kids, uh, a safe place for kids, a resource for parents. But thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Thank you, uh, Chris, and thank you, listeners, for joining in with me today. And as always, remember to think better.